Um, okay, I think we're I think we're ready. Be glad to help. Test if the live stream's there. All right. As always, in theory, this should be live. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Monday's episode of Open Space here on my YouTube channel. Um, and this week, I'm joined by Sean Carroll. Is it Professor Sean Carroll, Dr. Sean Carroll? I know it's both, but which, which is the one that you prefer? I go with Sean. Sean is fine. Sean? Okay. <laughs> Sean. Um, <laughs> And uh, for those of you, of course, who, who don't know, uh, you are a professor at Caltech. Caltech, that's right. And, uh, and which you will hear, obviously, we're going to get into. He has written a brand new book, Something Deeply Hidden. I'm a third of the way through. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying it. And uh, we're going to get into to that as well as a bunch of other topics. So, Sean, thank you so much. Welcome. Sure. Thanks for having me on, Fraser. Uh, all right. So for anyone who maybe isn't familiar with your work, can you give your, your, uh, your intro? Sure. I'm a theoretical physicist at Caltech. And, you know, I, I think pretty widely about fundamental questions of physics, you know, what the universe is made of. I've done a lot of work in cosmology, gravity, things like that, dark matter, dark energy. These days, I'm thinking more and more about quantum mechanics and the foundations of quantum mechanics in particular. So I want to care about what actually happens when you make a quantum measurement, what is the relationship between the formalism of quantum mechanics and reality. We can talk about what that actually is, but I, I need to say those words explicitly because not everyone who is a theoretical physicist does care about the relationship of quantum mechanics to reality. Uh, and so that's part of the messages of the book, which is that you know we need to care. Whether or not you like my particular view of it, I think that caring about reality is something that all physicists should be doing. All right. Well, uh, of course, you, I mean, you have a great podcast. I highly recommend it. I've really been enjoying it. It's not just talking about physics, but literally whatever is striking your curiosity, which is a lot of fun. Um, you have written many books before this. You show up on, on the, various, uh, the various channels, on the TVs from time to time to, to provide sound bites of, uh, about various uh, issues in, in physics and astronomy. So, so, but but I'd like to spend some time on this book, and then and then talk about some some other topics. So, you know, you led into this a little bit. This idea, and you know, that I got with something deeply hidden, you know, is that is that quantum mechanics is one of the most sort of accurate and uh, precise methods that we have devised to be able to make measurements in this world, and yet it's super weird, and the way it actually functions under sort of the underlying physics of it is poorly understood and kind of makes people uncomfortable to attempt to understand it. So can yeah, you sort I of ex that, uh... explain this for us? Right. I mean, when we say it's poorly understood, what the, the most correct way of interpreting that is to say that physicists don't agree <laughs> about what quantum mechanics actually says. Uh, it's always possible that one or more of them do understand it, but they don't agree with each other. So it's impossible that a majority of them understand it. Right. Uh, quantum mechanics came to us beginning of the 20th century, was put in its current form around 1927. And it's this theory that ma tries to make sense of the microscopic world where things are sometimes acting like particles, sometimes acting like waves, for example. And the primary thing that we tend to say is that an electron, let's say an elementary particle, something that's tiny and irreducibly quantum mechanical, acts like a wave when we're not looking at it, when it is not being observed. But when you observe it, it acts like a particle. And those, those statements are enshrined in all the textbooks that we use to teach quantum mechanics to our undergraduates, et cetera. But it's clearly nonsensical, or at least it's clearly inadequate. There's no way that the act of observation plays a fundamental role in physical theory. I mean, the universe existed long before observers did. And even worse, you haven't told me what you mean by an observation. So this is called the measurement problem of right. quantum mechanics. Did you look at it? Did you... Did you yeah, well, what counts is looking at you know, who looks you, at it, right? Yeah, did does a tree a cat fall in count, the forest? Does yeah. a virus, right. right. So, um, 
but for whatever reason, uh, you, you might think that trying to understand this measurement problem is going to be really, really important to physicists because we care about understanding nature. But in fact, we have decided that not only is it not important, but if you care too much about it, we will kick you out. Uh, historically, people who have tried to solve the measurement problem were either young people who were dissuaded from continuing or old people whose you know, serious work has been finished and now they were sort of puttering around. And none of that is very satisfactory, but I think that it's changing. I think there's more and more people today who really do care about trying to understand quantum mechanics. All right. So let's talk about what that means to actually understand, because you mentioned this idea that that all the particles we understand them or is all of the, you know, an electron, say we understand it as both a wave and a particle, depending on the way that you are observing it. And and you lay out this really great case in the book that essentially, you know, it is it is this uncollapsed wave function until you make this observation and right. the particle collapses and you can measure its position or you can measure its spin or you can measure its momentum or whatever is the measurement that you're trying to make. And, and absolutely before then it was a prob probability function and it could have been anywhere. It could have been in whatever was the spins. It is the act of measurement that gives it that, that definition, which is super weird. And it, and it, in every other field of physics, the moment you see something that like this, which provides this really bizarre outcome, and yet the process that's leading up to that bizarre outcome is poorly understood, the focus will shift like a laser beam on the process that's leading up to the outcome. So why is the process? Why is it? I mean, not only does it sound like it has less emphasis than it should, it actually sounds like it's almost heretical to ask that question. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on, and I don't actually have a quick, glib answer to why physicists have taken this particular attitude. You know, this was the subject of the famous Bohr-Einstein debates in the 20s and 30s. Niels Bohr, the father of traditional quantum mechanics, the father of the Copenhagen interpretation, which really said, yeah, something like an electron acts differently if you're looking at it or if you're not looking at it. And Einstein was a dyed-in-the-wool realist. He was much more you know, specific about he wanted to know exactly what happened. He didn't believe that a human being looking at something should really change it in some particular way. So Einstein said, quantum mechanics isn't finished yet. It's not true that Einstein didn't like or didn't understand quantum mechanics. That's just a myth. But he did say it can't possibly be the final answer in its current form. We need to do better. And for whatever reason, um, I think there's, there, there are good reasons and there are less good reasons, but Einstein lost the public relations battle there. Uh, Bohr and his colleagues and collaborators won the day. And part of it was simply that it was hard to know how to make progress on these deep questions of quantum mechanics. And it was much more straightforward to say, look, we're trying to understand nuclear physics and atomic physics and particle physics and condensed matter and all these things. Don't bother us with these somewhat philosophical questions about what's really going on. And, you know, if you think about it, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, there were other things that yeah, physicists were worried about during those days than the foundations of quantum mechanics. But, but I mean, the impression that I get is that it continues to this day. And, and you say that, you know, if a person wants to try to figure out, figure out the, the underlying sort of like what's going on, they're dissuaded from moving in that direction. They have difficulty getting tenure. They are like, what are the consequences for a person who says, I'm going to spend my, my mathematics career exploring what's happening before the wavefront, you know, collapses? Yeah, you know, it's not like, I don't want to give the impression that there's some sort of Stalinist conspiracy yeah, to yeah. stamp out people thinking about these things. Um, as usual in academia, the thoughts and their effects are much more indirect. So if someone, you know, spends their, they go to graduate school, they say, I want to study string theory. And then once they get there, they realize, oh my goodness, we don't even understand quantum mechanics. Why in the world am I studying string theory? I want to understand quantum mechanics at a fundamental level. It's not that you know, they're kicked out or uh, because someone learns that they were studying quantum mechanics, they're blackballed or anything like that. It's when they apply for jobs, 
there's no one looking to hire someone who studies the foundations of quantum mechanics, right? So it's not some active discrimination. It's just like, that's something we don't care about. So, you, you know, if you had decided to study UFOs, we would have done the same thing. You know, we just don't yeah. want to hire someone who studies UFOs. Sorry. So at, at that it ends up where either people just don't study that at all, or they switch into something like philosophy. There's a lot of people who are currently top-notch philosophers of physics who have PhDs in physics, but then realize they would never get hired in a physics department studying what they want to study, so they're now professors of philosophy. Right. But you mentioned another kind of uh, experimental mathematics, like string theory, this idea, you know, that tries to get at what is the fundamental nature of reality and is attempting to, um, to merge together, say, gravity and, and quantum mechanics. Does string theory provide a certain amount of concrete understanding that, that understanding what's, you know, the, the wave particle duality doesn't? String theory has precisely zero to say about the measurement problem of quantum mechanics. It just assumes quantum mechanics is right, just like any other approach does, just like loop quantum gravity or supergravity or causal set theory. I mean, all of these assume there's some basic structure of quantum mechanics and then go from there. Quantum mechanics, you have to understand, it's not like general relativity or Maxwell's electromagnetism. GR and electromagnetism are specific physical theories about specific phenomena meaning to be explained. Quantum mechanics is a framework in which you can study all sorts of different things. It's just like saying classical mechanics. Classical mechanics, as invented by Isaac Newton, is a way of doing physics. It's, it's a way that got superseded by quantum mechanics. But Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism or Einstein's theory of general relativity are all classical mechanical theories. Likewise, quantum electrodynamics or the standard model of particle physics or superstring theory are all quantum theories. None of those theories have anything to say about the measurement problem. The measurement problem is just as much there in any of them as in any other. Right. So then your preferred um uh, interpretation or, you know, is the many wheel, many worlds, uh, interpretation. Mm -hmm. So can you sort of, I guess, I guess, give people like your definition of, of what that means so that we can then sort of play around. In yeah, many this worlds? is an idea put together by Hugh Everett, who was a genius physicist, who was just a graduate student in the 1950s. And he realized two things. He says that, that, you know, if you, if you think about the traditional Copenhagen interpretation, which says the electron is kind of like a wave until you observe it and then it collapses and looks particle like it's suddenly located in one position. He said, you're missing two things. Number one, you're forgetting that you, the observer, are also quantum mechanical, okay? Right. You have a wave function. You're made of atoms and electrons and protons and neutrons. Yeah. So you can't treat yourself as classical and then treat the electron you're looking at as quantum mechanical. That's not consistent. You need to treat both as quantum mechanical. And the other thing is something pointed out by Einstein in the 1930s, namely that quantum systems can become entangled with each other. You know, we talk about the possible observational outcomes in quantum mechanics. If we were to measure the location of something or the spin of something, there's a probability you get various things. And those probabilities for getting different measurement outcomes for different parts of the universe can be related to each other. So you can have two particles that are both spinning, right? And, and when you measure the spin, let's say you have an example where it's either spin up, which means it's spinning clockwise in some direction, or spin down, it's spinning counterclockwise. And then you have two particles. So both of them could be spin up or spin down, but you can be in a situation where you know that the spins are opposite. So you don't know whether one spin is up or down, but you know that they're both in opposite directions. That's entanglement. So even though you don't know anything specific about either subsystem, you know something about the combined subsystem. And Everett says that's what happens when you measure the position of an electron. It's not that the electron's wave function suddenly dramatically changes. It just interacts with you and your wave function, and they become entangled with each other. Right. And they become entangled with each other in such a way so that there's part of the wave function that says the electron was here and you saw it here. There's another part that says the electron was there and you saw it there. There's another part that says the electron was there and you saw it there. And that's 
clear, that's unambiguous. It's absolutely obvious that that's what's predicted by quantum mechanics. Right. And the question is, what are you going to do about it? Right. And what Bohr said is you chop off almost all of them randomly, leaving you one particular possibility. And what Everett says is, no, just leave them all there. They're fine. Yeah. Just chill out about it. Right. Just think of the fact that once they're there, they don't interact with each other anymore. There's nothing that happens in one part of the wave function that can possibly influence or have any causal uh, effect on what happens in the other one. So you should treat them as separate worlds, as separate copies of reality doing different things. And the reason why it looks to you like there's some random jump when you observe a quantum system is because suddenly you're only in part of the wave function that you used to be in all of before. And I think, you know, we get this crossover from f actual physics that can be observed and experimented in great detail. And the, the kinds of physics experiments that have been done are just, just astonishing how oh, yeah. well physicists have been able to tease out every single little, little piece of this. And what science fiction has told us about multiple universes and many worlds and parallel universes and, and all of this kind of thing. And that's not physics's fault. That is science fiction writer's fault to put into everybody's mind that there are all these different universes all happening in the same time. You can jump from universe to universe and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, how do you, unencumbered by science fiction, picture this idea of, of these many worlds? And well, maybe me, many worlds is the wrong term to use because it is too evocative. We can imagine a world. We can imagine many of them. Is there another term that maybe takes us down a different path? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's a bunch of things to say here. One thing to say is I think the physicists do share some of the blame for the fact that people misunderstand these things. It's not just science fiction writers who are to blame. Um, Science fiction writers are to blame because they give in to temptation, right? You know, like, of course, once you realize there might be many worlds, you want to do things like travel between them or talk between them or whatever. And if the physicist says, no, you can't do that, they're going to say, well, I'm going to do it anyway because yeah. it's my novel yeah, or words. my screenplay, right? Yeah. Um, but the physicists share some of the blame because they're, number one, not facing up to reality. They're not really, really trying to get it right. And number two, they're not very good at explaining it when they do try to explain it. How can you explain what quantum mechanics actually says if you don't agree on what quantum mechanics actually says? So you start saying contradictory things. You start just emphasizing how weird it all is. And people run with that. And that's, that's absolutely science's fault as well. So to get to the real question here, you know, how do you imagine it? How do you visualize it? Look, you kind of can't visualize <laughs> this, okay? And I know that's a cheesy answer, yeah. but by the very concept of visualizing, we're already limiting ourselves to things that exist in some three-dimensional space. And quantum mechanics just isn't like that, you know, yeah. sorry. Like, it's hard enough to visualize the whole universe, especially a four-dimensional universe, but now we're imagining some huge number of copies of that four-dimensional universe that exist not anywhere located in space, but just simultaneously exist in some abstract mathematical formalism. There's no place where these things exist. We can talk very specifically about how they evolve and, you know, starting from some initial condition where they're going to go. Um, but we can't really say, like, there they are. <laughs> they're over there or right. anything like that. You just have to sort of, at yeah. some point, and I really always hate to say this, but at some point it's true, you have to just trust what the math is saying. Right. I mean, I, I, mean, I think, you know, you have a version of that when you're thinking about, say, the potential quantum states of particles like if you could have to say a finite number of quantum states within a cubic meter of space that there right. could be so many particles they're spinning in certain ways and you could with a finite number be able to describe what is in that cubic meter of space and you could then if it if there is some kind of like resolution some kind of uh you know whatever is the resolution minimum resolution of of the many worlds and you can then imagine that sort of proceeding forward in time and you can imagine what is a you know all of the particles all of which are you know having various probability states and then they're also you add one more dimension does that it, well, get you no, partway there or even that's not no, good enough? It really, really doesn't. It's much yeah. worse than that. Just okay. To, All right. To be honest about it. Yeah. Um, for one thing, so 
you know, mathematicians are very good at talking about the dimensionality of arbitrary spaces, right? So like we talk about a three-dimensional space that we live in, but mathematicians talk about different spaces of different dimensionalities. So for example, if you have one particle, just in classical mechanics, like the simplest possible thing, one particle, its position is somewhere in three-dimensional space, okay? But it also has a velocity, and the velocity is a different three-dimensional space, the space of all velocities. It can be moving in any direction. And then you can combine them together to make a six-dimensional phase space, the spaces of all positions and velocities of the particle together. And if you have n particles, then you have a six n dimensional phase space. So if you have a cup of coffee with 10 to the 23 particles in it, that's six times 10 to the 23 dimensional phase space, which is a lot of dimension. Sure, but that we know of, there could be a whole bunch of other dimensions we don't even know of. Well, but but my point is those are not the same kinds of dimensions as three dimensions of space. It's It's entirely different mathematical space. And quantum mechanics is way worse. <laughs> Naively, if you look at the possible positions of the cup of particles in the cup of coffee, the dimensionality of the space describing those is infinite. Even if there is only one particle in the cup, it's still an infinite dimensional space. You need right. to describe it because there's an infinite number of positions that the particle could have. Even if you forget about the positions and talk just about the spins, there's only two possible spins, but it's not two times 10 to the 23. It's two to the power of 10 to the 23 sure. is the dimensionality. Yeah, these are big, once they turn into big numbers, I mean, you gave us the number for the chances that the entire universe will reform uh, into a new Big Bang. And it was, I forget the number, it was huge with, you know, something to the power to, to the power. It was a big well, number. Yeah. <laughs> but I could see it. You but, know, I could write it down. You know, you can write was, down the number, but I can you can't down. visualize those possibilities. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an example of trusting the math, writing down the number and saying, okay, that's, bit, that's what's going on. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's exactly. You but, you know, it's one thing to write down a number where it's something to the power of something to the power of something. Um, and it's different to, you know, having some kind of uh, calculus where you are going to infinity, right? Like, like infinity makes things, and infinity is where our brains break. Don't, we don't know if the number of possible worlds is finite or infinite. That's right. something we have not yet okay. figured out. Yeah. It's uh, big. It's a lot. Yes. Right. And But even that, like, I mean, it feels to me like, you know, what I just said is an unsolved question in math. Wouldn't it be great if somebody was able to get to the bottom of it? At least, no. Well, we, we, we haven't. I mean, it would be great if yeah. we could get to the bottom of it. But uh, I we just haven't. gave yeah, you a, a task. A physics. I, you know, Feel I know free. it. I've already I've written papers about it. You're too late. You <laughs> oh, know? OK. Yeah. But it's not settled yet. We yeah, haven't. But, uh, we don't understand these things. It's right. Like, you said I got yet. nothing in your paper. The gist was I don't I got nothing. But well, know. I think it's I think that I have an opinion. I think yep. that the number of possible worlds describing our observable universe is finite. Uh, but the number of possible worlds describing the universe as a whole, observable and unobservable, is probably infinite. There you go. That's my guess. Perfect. That's fine. Great. Um, now, now you, you know, I have been watching uh, Twitter and YouTube, and I've definitely seen uh, some pushback against the book that you've written. Uh, some have I'm been surprised. very surprised. I thought that everyone would just say, "Yes, you're right." I know, I, I know, and some are very charitable, here. and and yeah. others seem a little snarky. And um, of course, you know, as I've mentioned, I mentioned to you this beforehand. You know, as a lay person, um, this is all just magic to me and i sort of liken this to uh gandalf is having the argument with saruman about the nature of magic um and but what like what argument against what you're proposing do you feel is the most powerful what do you think i think is- there are two actually uh that are that are perfectly reasonable worries and I, i've thought a lot about both of them one is uh the most well-known one is the probability question so in ordinary quantum mechanics in the textbooks you say all we can do is predict the probability of getting a certain outcome and the way to predict it is to take the wave function for that outcome and square it so when you take a number that could be positive or negative and square it you get a positive number and so that's a it's a good candidate for a probability Um, But it's an axiom, just a postulate. You just put it out there. And many worlds doesn't give you the room 
to make such a postulate. In many worlds just says you have a wave function and it evolves. So you have to derive the fact that the probability is proportional to the wave function squared. And for that matter, what do you mean? By probability. Now, like, when you say derived, do you mean mathematically or you need to make observations and it tends towards it? Like if you were trying to sort of estimate pi by measuring circles and measuring diameters as opposed to. I mean, what you want math. is a logical argument that says if many worlds is right, then people should expect to see experimental outcomes with this kind of probability. Right. Rule. That's what I mean. So it's a, it's a logical derivation from some axioms. And. Um, the problem is that in many worlds, every outcome happens in some world or another. <laughs> so what do you mean when you say the probability of seeing one example is high and the other one is low, when you know that there will be worlds with each one? How do you compare the worlds? And I think that we have very good arguments that you know there is an obvious logical way to do it and you get the right answer. But I, I am willing to admit that uh, people are... are it's not so good, our arguments, that you just have to bow down and say, yes, you know, yeah. you're allowed to disagree. You're allowed to be skeptical. The arguments aren't quite that good yet. And the other uh, argument, the, the other potential problem with Everetti and quantum mechanics is precisely that it is too lean and mean as a theory of the world, you know? It's the simplest possible quantum mechanical theory. It says there are wave functions and they evolve and that's it. And so it doesn't make any reference to not just tables and chairs, but electrons or electromagnetic fields or quarks or neutrinos or anything like that, or even space-time, right? So really, you have to show us how you start with this very abstract notion of a quantum mechanical wave function and extract the classical world that we're familiar with, where there are tables and chairs. Like, why does the world look classical at all mm -hmm. is a big problem for many worlds. Again, it's solved in other theories by just putting it in, just assuming it. But many worlds doesn't let you do that. You have to derive everything. So, um, you know... Let's talk about it from like an experimentalist point of view. Um, you know, the any theory, and this is sort of one of the problems with string theory, is there aren't a lot of experiments that have been proposed that will allow you to practically get your head around whether or not this is correct. And any that are figured out are like gold. Um, what are some interesting experiments that you can imagine or, you know, with an unlimited budget or even with particle accelerators or whatever that you would love to be able to run at any scale, I mean, feel free to use warp drives and whatever to try and get a sense of what's of what's going on. Yeah, you know, it's hard in this particular case because, um, I mean, it depends on what it depends on what you want. If you want to say, can we falsify many worlds? Right? Can we do an experiment that shows that many worlds is wrong? That's absolutely possible. In fact, the experiments are going on yeah. because all many world says is that wave functions always obey the Schrodinger equation. All you need to do is show they don't obey the Schrodinger equation right. at some point. So there are alternatives to many worlds. There's a, a famous alternative called dynamical or spontaneous collapse theories, where the wave function just collapses all by itself in complete violation of the Schrodinger equation. So if that's true, you can experimentally test it. There's a very clever experiment being done where you take a large number of atoms and you cool them down to very close to absolute zero. And then you wait, cross your fingers, and if one of them undergoes one of these spontaneous collapses, the whole collection of entangled atoms will heat up just a little tiny bit. And so if you see that happening and you didn't make an experimental mistake, that would be experimental evidence that the Schrodinger equation is wrong. Is that not just an, a different kind of observation? No, without looking at it. That's the point. Like you isolate it. It's just sitting there but, all by itself. Isn't looking at nearby particles looking at it i mean no there's a very specific definition of okay. what you mean right. by looking at it it means to entangle in a certain way okay. with the okay. environment and, and decohere so so this is a, this is an example of, of how you can rule out many worlds now there is another famous alternative called bohmian mechanics or hidden variable theories and those are harder i don't know of a way to distinguish those experimentally from many worlds i i have this there are there are theorems that say you can't distinguish them from many worlds. But I don't even trust the theorems. Theorems are mathematical things, and they're only as physically relevant as their assumptions are right. So part of me just resists the idea that this entirely alien theory gives you the same prediction. So I, I need to think about that more. But um, the other possibility is that 
you use many worlds or some other fundamental theory of physics to build a specific theory of quantum gravity or quantum field theory or whatever, and then make predictions about that. And so that's a very exciting possibility and one that we haven't really examined as much as we should. So again, I think that we were held back by the fact that we haven't been thinking about this right, for of course, decades. The point of your own and, book. So, yeah. And a lot of it is not that there aren't experimental tests, but that we haven't thought of them yet. Right. And, and so, I mean, can you give like a practice? I mean, maybe you just haven't thought enough about it enough, but I just, you know, can you imagine an apparatus? Can you imagine an experiment? Can you imagine a, you know, you take a, you know, you take a neutron star, you smash it into a black hole. Like, like, again, feel free. I will yeah, write you the check. Know, you know. But we don't know. Yeah. We don't know what the predictions are. That's the, that's the thing. You, you don't know what experiment to do until you've made some predictions. I mean, of course we should test quantum mechanics in all the ways we can. Uh, and we should look at the universe through particle accelerators and telescopes and so forth. There's every reason to keep doing that. And, but there's a sort of fishing expedition feeling about it. You know, like you hope that you learn something surprising. Uh, but it would be much more efficient if we had a strong, clear prediction to aim for. Right. Uh, so now that you the book is out, um, have you... So, so I'd like to shift gears a little bit and just talk about sort of the nature of science communication, because I think you are a person who has had a pretty lucky, um, or, you know, not, lucky is not the right word, a, a, um, a, you've done a great job of making sure that you've been able to take advantage of all of the different distribution platforms that have been available before the internet, uh, popularizing books and going on TV shows and, and being recorded in, in newspaper articles and so on but also have transitioned nicely into this modern age of the internet with your wonderful podcast, um, which I highly recommend. You're active on Twitter. Uh, do you think that sort of how these modern communication channels have, have shown up? Has that, what impact do you see that having on researchers like yourself and others who are attempting to communicate their results out to the world? Yeah, you know, I think that it's still very much in flux. You know, we don't have, uh, we're not in equilibrium yet. Let's put it that way. I don't, I don't think that we've saturated all the different kinds of communication channels that we will have, and we haven't really perfected how we're going to use the ones that we do have. Like, I, I've become a terrible blogger. I used to be a great blogger yeah. uh, at I loved my your website, blog. yeah. And I, I've just. Uh, my energies have gone elsewhere. Like I never stopped enjoying blogging, but you know, I have other things to do and only a finite number of hours in the day to do them. You know, my day job is still doing research in physics and yes. that's, that's got to take up most of the time. Um, but yeah, you know, Twitter is good, but I like Twitter. Uh, I, I don't like carrying out conversations on Twitter, to be perfectly honest. People complain about Twitter and I think that their complaints are either because they're following the wrong people or they're letting the wrong people follow them. Let's put it that way. They can block people. Or they're just trying to use it for something it's not meant for. Like, it's meant for pointing at things and say, like, go look at this more deep discussion. It's not meant for having a deep discussion right, right there, in, in my view. Yeah. Um, the podcast is still something that I'm uh, learning about myself. My podcast called Mindscape is a little bit over a year old. It started last summer. So I just published uh, episode 66. And why I really like it, and not everyone uh, is happy about this, but I like it because it's not not just physics, right? There's plenty of my audience members who want me to do nothing but physics, but that would be boring for me. And, you know, I, I'd like, I want to use it precisely to break out of the standard academic silos that say that you should just do your specialty and nothing else. So I will talk to economists and uh, movie directors and neuroscientists and philosophers and poker players and as long as someone is very, very smart and has some good ideas, um, I can have a good conversation with them. And yeah. so I think that, you know, again, we haven't really perfected this, so I don't know where it's going, but I've, I've just been very, very pleased with the reaction in most quarters. Like I, I tease people who think I should just be doing physics, yeah. but there's a lot more people also who like the variety that they're getting in the podcast. I do think, by the way, if there's anyone out there, there's not a lot of straight physics podcasts. Like there could be more. Yeah. There's still room out there. Uh, there's a there's several astronomy podcasts, mm -hmm. but just like a I'm familiar. physics podcast that would t explain the the recent wrinkles in cosmology or particle physics or whatever. There's room for that to happen if you really want to do that. But even more than that, I mean, I think there's room for a 
physics podcast that is directed at other physicists. Like I'm, oh, well, you know, yeah. but I mean, like, like I think that, that the default right now is that, you know, your job is to communicate what you're working on to the general public. And like one, that's my job. But, you know, um, but no, I'm like, I can't wait until I'm run out of town and I no longer have to do my work because you all do such a great job of communicating what you're working on that the need of a science journalist is no longer required, right? Because, you know, I mentioned this, uh, I think last week, you know, I'm, I am, you know, my background is in computer science, not in astronomy. This happens to be my chosen career for 20 years. And so I've gotten very good at understanding a high level of everything. But, but I think that there's real value in practicing again and again, communicating what it is that you're working on to both the public, but also to your peers. So I, I think that there, not only is there demand for, for more, you know, podcasts that cover physics, but there, there should be more that where the target is other physicists, where they don't have to, um, simplify the the language in such a way. I would be, I'm amazed that there aren't more of that. There wouldn't be a lot of listeners. Yeah, I think, but they'd be really I mean, I think there's two, two big things for me to say here. One is it will never happen that the, the, the need for science journalists and science communicators will go away because as much as I think it's important as a field for physics or other areas of science to reach out and have the professionals talk directly to people, um, it's, I don't think it's important for every individual scientist to do that. Some scientists are just not good at that. That's just not their strength and never will be, but they're brilliant scientists. Mm -hmm. So they're doing brilliant work that they're not very good at communicating. So there's absolutely a call. And I'm not going to communicate their stuff. Like I want to communicate my stuff. Yes. <laughs> so right. there's absolutely always going to be a place for good old writing and speaking and journalizing uh, aimed specifically at science. Now, I'm you raise not a, concerned. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, but you raise the interesting question of how scientists talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in some sense, I just don't have the courage or stamina to tackle that one because scientists are so ornery and yeah. so backward and so bad at this. Uh, they don't want to be innovative when it comes to methods of communication. Um, it would be, you know, so nice. We, everyone has said for, for decades now that you know, wouldn't it be nice every time that someone wrote a paper, there was a nice little summary of the paper, either visually or audio or, you know, some way that was made it understandable just to scientists, you know, like yeah. everyone knows that the traditional method of scientific communication in person is giving a seminar, but you can get an hour long seminar and it's always, you learn much more in 10 minutes of talking to them one-on-one -on -one than you do in the seminar because giving a seminar is just a very un Efficient, inefficient way of, of communicating the information. But if you're talking to one person, you can like be more casual, you get right to the point. Um, so I think that whether it's podcast or video or whatever, um, there's enormous room for growth in the efficiency and effectiveness of communication within the scientific community. But I don't know exactly how it's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I look at, you know, I, I troll through uh, archive every day, uh, mm -hmm. looking at all the papers and am able to get the gist to the point that I can write a story and, you know, get quotes and get information. And there's a lot of really wonderful stories that are passing through this. Um, you know, I know they're, they're pre-press and I know to, you know, take things with a grain of salt. You know, I've, I've had my wrists smacked enough times by people like you to know, you know, how to do this carefully, but, and they would be a press release and they would be on the cover of the New York times or they would be in the science section of the New York times. If it were just that somebody, a press officer at that university took the time to write them a press release and, and fired out through the regular channels. And because that doesn't happen, that person doesn't get a chance to have that, that material go any farther. And right. I think in the, in the old world, and maybe this was never true that the, that a research, the researchers find each other and they cite each other's work and people gain a following through merit probably is the expectation. Let's pretend, Let's pretend okay, that yeah. that's how it works. <laughs> and, and now there is this sort of 
you know, uh, Kardashian effect on top of it, where there is a certain amount of publicity that goes to certain kinds of topics. And there's a certain, you know, there are researchers, um, we can name any names who have, uh, you know, a growing star in the wider field of of science communication and are also still researchers and are able to play those two together. So I think there is huge value for this. And yet, um, there is almost like an institutional reticence to encourage people to go into this direction. And it seems really counterproductive to me. And, and you're exactly right. Like if someone could write at the beginning of every, you know, was, you know, every paper they write, here is the one paragraph that is the general person's language understanding of what it is that I am proposing or whatever, what I've found or whatever, that would allow all of us to quickly get the gist of what it is. Yeah, and I think um, there's a lot of incentives in the system that make it difficult for this to happen. Like, uh, forget about, you know, having your own podcast or whatever. Just if you have the impression that your colleagues get from you that you're too interested in teaching or outreach or anything like that, it can really hurt your chances of getting a high level job at a research institution. That's that's not what you're supposed to be doing. Um, it's It's always been weird for me because... There are other things you could be doing, like if you if you like playing baseball or, you know, playing guitar or whatever, that's OK, because that's just a hobby. But giving talks about science is bad because there you could be doing research, like somehow that's competing with the yeah. time you could be spending doing research. So it's actually actively worse. Um, and it's very like the job market is terrible. If you get a PhD in theoretical physics from a place like Caltech, you get maybe a one in four, one in five chance of ever being a tenured professor. So to say, well, I'm going to make that chance lower by spending some of my time uh, communicating and or anything like that. Well, you can do that if you want, but you better do it with eyes open. You better know what you're doing. And the same thing is true with trying to improve teaching or communication within the community. It's just not what you're paid to do. So why does it make the chances lower? I mean, you know, I am friends with many people who are PhD astronomers and, and I have absolutely watched this happen where they have become far more effective communicators. They've been able to expose themselves to ideas that they wouldn't normally do. There's, you know, they've had a chance to interact at a, with many different people, both at conferences and just the public who are, you know, are a lot smarter than anybody gives them credit for. And yet it's not seen as an advantage. It's seen as a disadvantage and not as, as you're exactly right. You know, if you spend, if your hobby is baseball, as opposed to your hobby, trying to communicate the work that you're doing to the public, one is seen as like, yeah, it doesn't matter. And the other one is seen as actively bad. Why is that? It's because it's time you're not doing research. But so is baseball. Yeah, but you know, it's, that's somehow you, it's the same mental space, right? Like if you write a textbook or you write a popular book or you give talks, that's time where your brain was doing things that in, I'm not defending this. Perspective. Yeah, yeah no, I'm just course, saying this is the perspective, but yeah. that's time yeah. that your brain could have been putting those cycles to work doing research. Whereas if you're at a baseball game or, you, or you, you're playing Frisbee or whatever, that's you're doing something different. OK, we're not inhuman. We don't think that you should be doing physics research 18 hours a day. But uh, there's you know, the theory, I think, is, which is always implicit. It's never stated explicitly. But the theory is you have a finite amount of effort in your week to put towards intellectual pursuits. And the larger that fraction of that effort is doing research, the better. And yet, I mean, I know, like, I know I'm kind of a broken record here. Um, but uh, the universities have public relations department, and they place an enormous amount of emphasis on the amount of press that the research that they're doing is getting out there on like, like if you write a paper, and that paper turns into a story on the New York Times, that is seen as a good thing. No, it's seen as a good thing to the press office. It's not seen as a good thing university... to your colleagues who vote to hire you and give you tenure. So the, so the university doesn't see that as a good thing, and they're the ones who give the you tenure. University doesn't matter. It's the department that. Matters. Okay, fine. So the department, the the fact that that physics developed in your department made it to the cover of the New York Times, is not interesting to the people in the department. 
it's not really relevant. They will judge for themselves whether they think the physics is good. You yeah. know, look, Stephen Hawking, yeah. when he uh, found the black holes radiate, he got on the cover of the New York Times yeah. and it was not held against him because he had done something brilliant and wonderful. But yes. the, what mattered was that he had done something brilliant and wonderful, not that he had gotten on the front page yeah. of the New York Times. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, you live with a uh, science communicator so i think you know you see the you know you see the way this all this all plays out but it is really it is really weird to me because because i think that the public craves it i think that well, the public it's especially that, that supports... weird in in a field like mine where there's no tangible benefits to what i yeah. do right yeah. <laughs> thinking about the foundations of quantum mechanics and cosmology uh it, it's not going to pay for itself economically we are, as a society, putting aside some of our wealth to support work like this. And I think that the bargain is we will then go back and tell people about it, right? Uh, so someone has to do that. And so I think, like I said, the field has a responsibility to do this. Yeah. But every individual university is just going to try their best to hire the most brilliant researchers. That's what they're, that's what they're trained to do. Yeah. And it's self-perpetuating. Once yeah. they're there, you know, they're going to hire people like themselves. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a funny thing, but I I like I I don't understand it, and but I but it doesn't matter to me because if you guys do figure it out, then I'm out of a job. So it's so it's perfectly <laughs> fine for me to uh, to just help you perpetuate it and and make you think that you guys you know you're too busy. You should just keep researching, and there's no point. But I I really think, and I'm sure you get it that from the feedback that you get from the podcast that you do, the in interesting conversations that you have both with, with people that are in fields that are not related to what you do, but also to the people who, who have, um, who have a direct connection to what you do. Your mind is being sharpened, people around you being educated. There is tremendous value in, in what you're doing. And if, and if the various university department, I guess in your case, it doesn't matter. You've got tenure, but um, you know, for a lot of the people who I don't, Oh, okay. I'll give it to you then. Here you go. Here. Okay, no. thanks. Um, but for the people who are are growing up in this in this field, like it, you know, Carl Sagan showed us how vital science communication is, and 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 what a beloved impact it's had. And so many people were inspired to go into the sciences, and so many people, like all of these things. There's this beautiful impact that happens, and it seems really weird to me. Very counterintuitive that this yeah. isn't appreciated and celebrated, and and that people are encouraged to to put in this work. And I know I'm I'm just you know I'm grinding you're appreciated and converted, yes. But yeah. and there's another aspect I think that is worth um, mentioning here. I mean, there's not only um, reaching out to the public, but then there's the you know what you are talking about when you do that outreach. Like my primary thing is not really traditional outreach like here's a cool thing about cosmology here's a cool thing about particles here's a cool thing about whatever my books and my podcast and my blog posts and my twitter are all forms of scholarship in some ways like i except for with a possible exception of the book i wrote on the higgs boson because that was like a special event that wanted to be covered but you know my books have arguments that you can disagree with you know my the quantum mechanics book something deeply hidden is, is not just hey isn't quantum mechanics cool it's saying look here's a perspective on quantum mechanics that may be right may be wrong uh it's at the cutting edge of what we're doing research on let me explain it to you give you my reasons for thinking that it's true and you can evaluate that argument and i think that uh you know the podcast in a less obvious way is the same kind of thing. I'm talking to people who are experts in their fields and it's an interdisciplinary conversation that wouldn't otherwise happen. So I think that one of the great things about the uh, explosion of different varieties of media that we can do this in is that not only can we reach people better, but we can have actual intellectual conversations that, you know, the past, uh, pass by the usual barriers of academia in interesting ways. So yeah. things are going to look very different 50 years from now yeah. when, when all this is settled down a little bit. Well, and I think also just that we can have a conversation on on what is a general purpose podcast. And I, you know, we don't have to go through, I hope, all of the talking points that you've been having to go through through the various interviews that you've had to do so far, right? My audience I can skip all the in-between parts yeah. and go straight to the more interesting, more advanced topics 
and get into the into the fun stuff. So um, we are. Kevin just asked, are we taking questions from the chat? I am. So, but I've also been hogging the the time. So please, uh, if you've got some questions, uh, you know, we've got about ten more minutes. I'd love to throw some of them uh, at Sean. There's a few that have already come our way, and there's one here that I think is is going to be uh, interesting. Um, Jesse Pinkman wants to know um, sort of your take on the M drive, and the the. <laughs> Jesse, love your work in, uh, in <laughs> Breaking Arizona. Bad. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, no. The M, M drive is entirely nonsense. Don't give it any thought. That that's my thought on it. You don't. You can't violate the laws of physics. Yep. You spend your money <laughs> obeying the laws of physics would be my yeah advice. <laughs> and it really seems like there's a perfectly rational answer, which is that you've got electricity interacting with the Earth's magneto mag magnetic field that almost completely explains the torque that they're detecting. So, um, yep. um, Kieran Garland says, hi, Sean, I value your work as an educator. Thanks for taking questions. I have a hard time grokking special relativity as a layman. Is it possible for you to briefly summarize the ideas? Um, there's a lot of ideas, so I need to pick and choose. Yeah. Um, my pick favorite way of thinking about special relativity is the following. So it's really the promotion of space plus time into one four dimensional space time, right? That's really the essence of special relativity with the speed of light being the conversion. So if you have a certain number of years, you can multiply it by, uh, light years or whatever to get, um, I forget how it goes, but I'm, I'm not going to do it in real time. And you can go back and forth from space and time. The difference, though, is the following, because obviously space and time are not exactly the same as each other. So in space, you can you know, have two points and you can draw a straight line between them, and that's the shortest possible distance. But you don't need to travel on the shortest possible distance. If you walk between these two points in space, you can take a longer path. There's a difference between the distance between the points and the distance that you actually travel, right? And this is just so obvious, no one even really bothers about it. So Einstein says the same thing is true for time. There can be two different moments of time, two different events in space time, and you can take a straight line through them, which means you don't accelerate, right? You just travel on a freely falling trajectory. And the difference is that that is the maximum time. That's not the minimum time you can spend between those two things. It's the maximum. But you can zip off. You can zip off at the speed of light, come back, okay? And then you would experience a different amount of time between those two events, just like if you took a curvy path, you would travel a different amount of distance. But because it's time and not space, you know that someone who zips off back and forth at the speed of light will always experience less time than someone who just takes a straight line between those two events. Perfect. Um, Kalen Batch asks, and I, I get this question all the time, um, not exact, not this specific, but it's good. So are there hints at evidence that would tell us that quantum mechanics is nonlinear in such a way that would enable communication between different branches of the wave function? I interpret that as, can we use entanglement to communicate faster than the speed of light? No, actually, those are two separate questions. Okay, They're great. Both they're both good questions, yeah. and the answer to both of them is no. <laughs> but one question says, within our branch, if I have two different particles that are entangled. Um, so go, let's go back to the example we had. We have two particles that are spinning in opposite directions, but they're entangled, and we don't know what answer we're going to get. What that means is if you measure one of them and you get spin up, then you know the other one is spin down right away, even if the other one is four light years away at Alpha Centauri or something like that. So you might think, well, what I've done right here has suddenly affected the thing over there. Can't I use that to send information and therefore communicate? But you can't because you know that you've measured spin up and therefore the other one is spin down. But the person on Alpha Centauri doesn't know that. Right. They don't know anything at all. So no information. If they, if they measure it, it will be spin down. Right. But they didn't know anything other than, well, it was 50-50. So no information. And there is no way to tell them that you have that you have collapsed the wave function on your side. There's no... There is. You can send them a laser beam and right. it takes four the speed years of light. to get there, right? Yes. So there's literally a theorem in quantum mechanics, a no signaling theorem that says you cannot use entanglement to send information faster than the speed of light. Now, in many worlds, once you've observed that spin and it's spin up, there's a whole other world where it was spin down. And you might ask, can I somehow communicate with that world? The answer there is also no, but it's for a different reason. It's just like, the space of possibilities is too big. It's, it's kind of one of these, uh, it's not actually strictly impossible to do it, 
But if you kept doing it at every point in space or the whole history of the universe, the chances are still infinitesimal it ever would have happened. Oh, this is a great question. So Trey Harmon asks, uh, please explain what happens to the gravitational force of particles and matter when it's converted to energy. So yeah, I, nothing at all. It's the same. That's the great thing. But, gravity is universal. So gravity doesn't care what's producing it. It cares about the total amount of stuff. So in fact, again, it's a theorem. If you have an amount of stuff that is in a sphere, okay, and you mess with it, so you like make it smaller or make it bigger or change it from iron to gold or lead or turn it into photons and it's just energy, from the outside, the gravitational field never changes through any of those things you do to it. If you make it not a sphere, then it will change a little bit. That's how you get gravitational waves. But as long as it's perfectly spherical, that's a theorem that you can show that nothing outside changes. So even in general, the stuff that the energy is made of, whether it's matter or different kinds of energy or whatever, that's not what matters, just the total amount of energy you have. Right. So you could turn your your particle into an equivalent amount, E equals MC squared of energy, and it would have the exact same amount of gravity. Yeah, yeah. which you kind of know must be true because the gravitational field stretches out throughout the universe, right? So if I had, a, you know, it's the same reason you know that electric charge is conserved. If I have an electron here and I imagine that I could just snuff it out, so not annihilate with another particle, but just literally erase that electron, that electron has an electromagnetic field, which then what suddenly disappears throughout the universe. I mean, that would that would be a way that you could send signals faster than the speed of light. So neither electric charge nor energy can just be created or destroyed at a local region of space. Uh, Roach Kai says, uh, does probability matter at all in many worlds? Yeah. Sure. I mean, you want at the end of the day to reproduce the successful empirical results of ordinary quantum mechanics, which include the fact that when you observe different quantum systems, you will get different results with different probabilities. So probability needs to be part of how we map many worlds onto the real world that we see. Um, uh, Jesse Pickman again asks, um, what about the state of quantum computing and its progress? Uh, what would you want to use it for if you were given a chance? I'm not a real expert on the technology. You know, we, we very recently had um, a breakthrough from Google yeah. in what's called quantum supremacy. But I mean, to be honest, what they basically did, quantum supremacy is the idea that there exists things that you can do on a quantum computer fast that would always be slow on a classical computer. And so they really <coughs> went out of their way to invent a problem that was just tailor-made for a quantum computer, and then they solved it, okay? Um, so no, pra not much anyway practical uh, implication there. What you would like to do is do something like factor large numbers. A lot of traditional cryptography these days <coughs> is based on the fact that if you have a 20 digit or 100 digit long number, it's very difficult to figure out what numbers you multiplied together to get that. Uh, it's possible a quantum computer could end up doing that very quickly. That would that would change cryptography as we know it. I was at a conference about five years ago, and folks from Google and NASA Ames were there presenting their latest research on quantum uh, computing. <coughs> and, the, and the gist was, we've got a quantum computer, we think, we're not sure if it is. Um, we'll get back to you. So this is five years. And in fact, their paper was published on at archive, and then it was pulled again. Right. Um, well, but, there are quantum computers. Maybe. Like, they exist. Maybe. No, no, they, no, no. 100%. But, they right. Exist. The point fact, being, though, they weren't sure. Five if, years ago, they weren't sure. Yeah. But now they're, they yeah. are sure that what they're not sure is that they can do a calculation faster than the classical computer. In fact, there's something I encourage everyone to check out called the IBM Quantum Experience, which is a website where they will let you run a calculation on a quantum computer with like three qubits or something like that. I forget how many qubits it is, but it's a very, very tiny number. Um, it might be as, as much as six. But the point is a qubit is one of these spins, right? That's either spin up or spin down, but really that's the observational outcome. When you're not looking at it, it's a combination, a superposition of spin up and spin down. And you want these bits to be entangled with each other and influence each other without ever being observed. And that becomes harder and harder and harder the more you add more qubits to it. So having 
going from zero to six is much, much easier than going from six to 12 yeah. and, and so forth. All right. I got one last question and then we're going to move into the shameless promotion portion of this. Uh, and this is great because we got this question and, and I have stumped Twitter on it. So, uh, Dim Bargain is asking, do gravitational waves travel at different rates through matter similar to light and refraction? So the Kilanova showed us that light and, and, um, radiation and gravity move at the same speed, the speed of light through the vacuum. Right. But if it was, say, jello, would the gravitational waves and the light arrive at the same time? Basically, gravitational waves are not slowed down. Uh, so the, the right thing to say, they're certainly not slowed down or their speed is not changed in the same way that electromagnetic waves are. And the reason why is because there are charged particles when it comes to electromagnetic waves. They're both positively charged and negatively charged particles. So when light travels through a medium, even if it's transparent, it's still nudging electrically charged particles, positive and negative in different directions. And that can slow down the light in very specific way. Whereas when it comes to gravity, there are only positively charged particles. There's only positive mass. There's no negative mass, negative energy particles in the real world. So it doesn't have the same kind of influence on gravitational waves that it would on electromagnetic waves. So you can certainly imagine in principle that even though light travels at the speed of light through vacuum, it doesn't when it travels through a medium, and therefore gravitational waves could get to you before electromagnetic waves could if the conditions are just right. And possibly a way to know if there's anything in the medium between you and where the kilonova went off. Well, it, in fact, it definitely happens. You know, yeah. we, we know that the polarization of light is definitely changed by traveling through a medium, a, a, a plasma, for example, and that absolutely happens. The effect on its speed is really, 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 really tiny. So that's hard to observe. But yeah, in principle, it happens. Wonderful. Uh, well, thank you for for providing that uh, that last answer. So let's get into the uh, to the where people should go next. So if you enjoyed this conversation, for starters, I highly recommend you go to sign up today right now go there's 500 plus of you watching right now and I know there'll be several thousand so if you listen to podcasts at all this should be on the list uh, I'm subscribed to it I've listened to every episode this is you know he didn't pay me at all um, <laughs> what is the name of your podcast it's the Mindscape podcast you can easily find it by typing in Mindscape or just Sean Carroll podcast and available wherever good podcasts are available yeah here we go oh no i haven't listened to uh will wickinson on the partisan polarization and the urban just came out today divide. yeah yeah just came out today but see look at all these little check marks yeah uh, oh, very good no. so oh, what's wait, your favorite one, one i haven't listened to what um, is your favorite one that was your side i haven't listened to your solo one because you know i figured you're just going to talk about quantum mechanics oh, um yeah, i did what was my favorite one i i I actually, I really enjoyed your two-part conversation on climate change with Michael Mann. And uh, yeah, I've, I've had a chance to interview Michael yeah. Mann before. And it's, uh, he's a fascinating uh, person to talk to, very down to earth, and is in the center of just the worst yeah. storm. So yeah. it's, been, it's been good. All right. And then the book. So something deeply hidden. Quantum Worlds and the Emergence of Space-Time. So you read the first third, which is sort of the straightforward third. Yep. The middle third is fun and games with um, Act 2, fun and games with many worlds. And then Act 3, the third part, is about quantum gravity and the emergence of space-time. Perfect. Um, and can I throw a plug in for uh, to your partner as a fantastic science communicator at some point? I should Absolutely. To, uh... Jennifer Willette. Yeah. Jen Luc Picant on Twitter. And yeah, she's on, and, Ar and she's at Ars Technica now, right? She's a staff writer for Ars yeah. Technica doing both science and culture. So she does a lot of the movie reviews for Ars now. Yeah. Absolutely terrific. One of my favorite science journalists. So, so pass along my uh, admiration. Yeah. Well, you know, you're, you have to be. So, uh, John, thank you so much for, uh, joining us today. I had a great time and, um, I wish you luck in convincing your, uh, the, all the folks in the physics community, uh, as you move forward on this, but at least my pleasure. Thanks, with your thanks to everyone who was listening in. All right. Thanks Take everybody. Care.